Good morning, everyone. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to the National Bank of Belgium's International Biennial Research Conference. So the biennial in English, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but it's every two years. Um, we are, of course, honored to have uh, very distinguished guests uh, and experts gather here today to explore a topic of vital importance. And that's actually the easy one to convince you that it's a topical uh, conference, deglobalization, decarbonization, and digitization. How do 3Ds affect firm pricing, markups, and productivity? And so, of course, in recent years, these uh, structural shifts have transformed the global economic landscape, influencing how firms operate, set prices, and shape their productivity, including uh, location in terms of production. So deglobalization, of course, uh, we know that it was spurred initially by political tensions, but also uh, uh, ever more by the weaponization of uh, supply chains. Uh, decarbonization, we all know about it, we hear about it, read about it every day uh, in, in, uh, in the newspaper. Uh, of course, we need to do something about it, but it's not easy, and understanding how uh, what are the implications and how it works uh, it, it remains uh, extremely important. Digitization, and ever more when we talk about it, artificial intelligence is most likely to reshape our industry. So we're really faced with two um, industrial revolutions running in parallel, the climate one, which is the first policy-induced industrial revolution that we ever uh, experienced, which makes it very unique. And then, of course, we have artificial intelligence with some people telling you that at some point there will be a singularity and then we'll be having fun every day in a virtual world and not having to work anymore. Um, so, again, I think this is the easy part. Uh, how do, do we uh, get a, a better grasp of these, of these evolution? Uh, and that's really the topic of the, the conference today. So, uh, how have we... Uh, Device, yeah, that's, sorry, that was the first slide, so the three, the three Ds. Uh, how have we uh, thought or structured the, the conference? So we have really designed the conference to offer a mix of high-level insights and detailed research. It is therefore a blend of keynote speeches, and you will have to bear with mine, from experts, uh, but also uh, uh, focused on research from Belgium and international academics. Uh, sometimes in close cooperation with the bank, and we have unique data sets and experience in dealing with these uh, unique data sets. So keynote speeches will bring high-level perspectives on the pressing uh, structural challenges that I just mentioned, but also set the stage for uh, deeper discussions on the topics. And the research projects, um, the conference will feature actually 11 research projects providing uh, each time in-depth analysis uh, and data-driven findings. Each project presentation will be followed by discussion from an expert in the topic addressed. And we also, of course, thank the discussants for their contributions to uh, these events. The keynote speakers, we have Mar uh, Reguant, and I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. Uh, I just discovered, discovered you were from uh, Spain. Um, Mar is a, is a renowned expert on energy markets, focusing particularly on the economic and environmental impacts of energy policies. So, most welcomed, uh, it is of course the name of the game. And her research provides insight into the challenges of decarbonizing the energy system, renewable energy integration, and the political economy behind the transition away uh, from fossil fuels. And today she will address the key question of how Europe can build a more efficient and competitive energy system. Later today, we will welcome Antonin uh, Bergo. He's young, uh, though already very well-respected voice in the fields of productivity and innovation. He was at the uh, Sintra conference a few months ago. Antonin's work sheds light on the recent slowdown in productivity growth across Europe and the factors that may drive future growth. And today, Antonin will offer his reflection on the past, present, and future of productivity growth and why Europe cannot afford to miss out on the next wave of technological advancements. And tomorrow, 
Uh, we will offer the stage to Paul Antras. Paul is undoubtedly a leading authority on international trade and global value chains. His research explores how international, multinational firms actually make sourcing and production decisions in an increasingly complex global economy and how these decisions are shaped by economic shocks and policy interventions. With growing discussions around deglobalization and the reshaping of global value chains uh, uh, in line indeed with uh, geopolitical preference, Paul's perspective will offer invaluable insights into how firms can navigate these changing dynamics. So here you see the word cloud of um, the abstracts and the conclusion of the 11 research projects. So it will talk a lot about firms, uh, impacts and effects of uh, a number of the, uh, the developments that I mentioned, uh, green, uh, Belgium here and there, jobs and, and the like. So uh, maybe just to give you a, a little feeling for the kind of questions that will be addressed, uh, on climate, how do national disasters impact firms and their supply chains? Uh, and we looked at the case of the Vesdre flooding here in Belgium. How do local support mechanisms and climate policies interact with the EU ETS? How can we ease the labor shortages, shortages sorry, for uh, green jobs? How do carbon prices trickle down the value chain? What are the distribution effects of carbon taxes? Just to give you a, a feel for what we are going to discuss. On digitization, uh, questions like what is the relationship between firms, ICT use, productivity and export, or how does digitization impact uh, a firm's workforce? On the globalization, what are the effects of trade, industrial and police, uh, public policy on the welfare of European regions? Or how does the restructuring of foreign activity impact the home country activities of multinational firms. But before moving to this interesting presentation, you will have to bear with me and the first keynote speech. Uh, first keynote speech that uh, I have entitled Waiting for the Recovery or Eurosclerosis 2.0. And yes, I will talk about Draghi. It's impossible not to talk about Draghi. But, but before going to Draghi, I'm, I'm really amazed by how fast the mood has changed in Europe. I mean, let's go back two or three years ago. We had a strong recovery. It was peak climate enthusiasm. We uh, decided on a number of climate policies. And the future was bright and the sun was shining. And now, two years later, it's doom and gloom. It's all about um, the lack of competitiveness of, of Europe and the difficulty of navigating the transition. I would plead for a middle ground between those two extremes uh, and, and trying to uh, maybe take some distance and not over-dramatize uh, uh, the situation we are, we are in, although I believe it, it is a difficult environment to navigate. So, I mean, the easy part, the delayed recovery, that has indeed contributed to the, the mood of uh, today. Uh, the recovery has been announced and delayed again and again, so we thought we would have a relatively strong growth in 23, it was not the case. In 24, it seems to be delayed, and we start asking questions about, about 25. The difficult part of the question here is what is cyclical and what is structural? And we have this feeling, for instance, when we look at Germany, that at least part of the delay in the recovery is structural, and that is probably uh, why uh, we are sometimes so gloomy. So to make sure that I'm not too gloomy, of course, we have some champions, we have some unicorns, so it's not like we are completely uh, lost in translation. But indeed, if we look, and there are very interesting charts and data in, in Draghi's report, if we look at uh, the most innovative firms uh, in the world, uh, they're not in Europe, or mostly not in Europe. The big ones with a valuation of uh, above 100 um, uh, um, Billions are essentially not in Europe. One way to look at it is just that we don't like disruption in Europe. And I think it's much more than just capital markets or the labor market or regulation. It's really a combination of all those. We have a culture where we like to be in control. 
we don't like disruptions, we don't like uh, things impacting us in a way uh, that, um, that might have implications, uh, for instance, in terms of redistribution, inequality, and the likes. So we are quite good, actually, uh, in the good old sectors where technological progress is incremental. When it's incremental, we are okay. You know, con combustion engine cars, robotics, optics, pharmaceuticals, airplanes, we're still relatively good. But when it moves fast, when it's disruptive, when you have to take big risks, we don't have uh, a combination of factors that probably they have in the US allowing us to do that. And let's be frank, the, the Steve Jobs and Elon Musk of these worlds are not part of a star system. When I think about what would be the likes in Europe, I can only come with one example that has been disruptive, and the guy is hated by everybody, is the boss of Ryanair, Michael O'Leary. That's, that is, to me, the only sector in Europe, and it was in an old industry, but the way they, they dealt with organizing the, the services was indeed disruptive. But the guy is being criticized every day in the media for being too tough, uh, for instance, on the labor front. And then, indeed, and I will come back to that, we have this inclination to control and regulate uh, GDPR. What, which minister in a national government would survive GDPR? I don't think any uh, minister coming with GDPR would survive it. Uh, in a national election. But in Europe, you can survive the GDPR because it's everybody and nobody. So uh, we have, of course, we want to regulate AI, and you hear a lot of people uh, among the big ones saying, you know, we are going to be late just because we don't want to be fast. And then in Belgium, you have the case of Ineos trying to invest uh, in the port of Antwerp, 4 billion investment. They have a permit, and then not, and then they have a permit, and then not. And the, the CEO of Ineos is saying, you know, I'm building five like that in Texas. I will not try again in Europe. So we know the gap with the US is widening. And then some people say, yes, but if you, if you exclude ICTs and the GAFAs, sorry, it's not GAFAs anymore, but I, I've lost track. Actually, it's not so different. So where it's really different, it's in uh, the AI, uh, ICT uh, sectors, uh, and, and it really depends on how you look at, at the data. But, but again, if we look at, at the most innovative firms, you know, the, um, uh, the above 100 billion, it's the, the, I guess the, the observation is quite clear. So the question I would be, want to raise here is, is it a choice? And I think we, we, we dismiss the question too much. I, th I, would, I would think that to a large extent it is actually a choice. And just incidentally for what it's worth, but there was this ranking of the most livable cities in the world, and we have very livable cities in Europe. So we have a sort of quality of life which goes with things not going too fast. But there is a price to pay. And maybe we should be a bit more honest about whether you know we just don't want to pay the price, and then maybe we have to uh, live with that. Um, I think it's a question that needs to be asked. What we know is that in Europe and Belgium, it is ever more about supply side. And of course, now the economy is weak, so it's also about demand. But, and, and maybe let's look at, let's look at this one, uh, financial uh, constraints. It's not that big. Now, if you, if you listen to the, to the public speeches made by uh, European authorities, let's put it this way, it's all about CMU. We need CMU to do the digital trans uh, transition. We need CMU to do the uh, uh, climate transition. Without CMU, we won't succeed in the climate transition. To finance EVs, to finance housing situation, BASF doesn't have access to capital markets. So what I want to say here is that we tend to summarize those difficult problems with a number of slogans. We are going to do CMU, and if we don't do CMU, it's going to be a failure. I think it's much more uh, about a system and a combination of factors than about one issue. And honestly, I would not put CMU on the most pressing issues. Uh, apparently, when you talk to risk capital uh, people in Europe, they tell you, oh, we don't have enough projects. It's not a problem of finding money. So uh, is there a cause for concern? I would say yes. And I think we are back to sort of Eurosclerosis 2.0. And then if you have the familiar foods and the additional pressures. I'm not going to go through all of them, but the familiar ones you know, uh, high tax burden, less dynamic this and that, regulation and so slower decision making. 
I think the big difference with um, uh, after the oil shocks when I was young is the labor market. Uh, there, it, the situation was really, really bad, and now it's quite good. But that's co of course, it's related to additional pressures. Number one, which is demographic pressure, which is actually going to weigh more on our economies than climate and defense and Russia. If you look at the big numbers and the impacts on productivity, on growth, on public finances, it is bigger uh, than the climate, but nobody wants to talk about it. And then you have, you know, uh, the budget challenges of defense and climate. Uh, we are stuck between China and US, it's the next slide. The risk of fragmentation in the global economy and of course uh, climate uh, issues. So being stu stuck with uh, 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 the US and China, when you talk to industrial pe in the industry now in Europe, you have a little bit the impression that whichever industry you talk to, except maybe tourism, you know, it's either the US is, is better placed or positioned or China. So we thought that, you know, being very ambitious on the climate front, we would be the first movers and develop a number of technologies. It's moving to China, uh, EVs, uh, solar, of course, but ever more wind as well. And then, of course, you look at uh, uh, heavy uh, energy in, uh, in intensive industries, it's the US, cheap gas, and they are so much better in the digital world, ICT and AI. So we have a difficult positioning in between those two. And I think part of it is that Europe was successful when it could uh, uh, work in an environment which was an environment with a level playing field, the good old days, and a rule-based world. That's the kind of world we like. Now, we are moving away from this world. We are moving away from a world that is rule-based and with a level playing field. We are moving to a transactional world. And the problem we don't have in these institutions to deal with the transactional environment. How do you deal with Trump who is going one day to say this and one day to say that when you have a decision-making process with 27 countries and sometimes discussions about what should be decided at the European level and what should be left at the national level? And of course, then you have the Draghi report. And what is clear about Draghi is that he acknowledges the problem. He says that we are faced with an existential challenge. Uh, we are going to be a society that basically shrinks and we are killing our companies, some of the quotes in the Draghi report. So he says basically we need to deregulate, de-risk and decarbonize. So Draghi is and, 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 and. And everybody is going to agree and disagree with Draghi's report because it's a combination of spending a lot of money, of dirigism, de and uh, messages against too much uh, regulation. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a, a mix back with uh, a lot of very interesting questions, uh, some uh, very interesting answers, but also, uh, I would say, some um, directions that, that may be open for discussion. So uh, he insists on reforming governance, improving decision-making, reducing policy fragmentation and the regulatory burden. We should strengthen and deepen the single market. But he also says we should spend a lot of money. And that's a bit ambiguous because it's the 800 billion. You don't really know where it comes from. Apparently, it comes from an ECB paper. And, and he's clear it's not 800 billion per year of public money. It says more or less 20% is public money. But 20% of that, that's still... Uh, you know, a good next generation EU uh, on top of next generation EU, so it's, it's a lot of money. So, you know, what about fiscal rules? What about uh, higher interest rates? Is it, is it feasible, even for the public part of it? And the private part of it, you know, again, is it just we need to do CMU, and how do we do it? Um, I'm not completely convinced. So that part of the Draghi report, in a way, you could just interpret it as, if, if we want, if we are successful, the ambition should be to go back to the level of investment we had in the 70s because we are confronted with a lot of challenges that require more investment. Um, you know, if you put it this way, I'm fine with it. If you put it in a more dirigist way that we have to spend all that money, I think it's going to be very difficult. And honestly, I mean, we have to, to, to ask ourselves the question, the next investment boom, you know, the, if we could only try what, once more, but we've been there so many times, so many times, the Lisbon Agenda in 2000, the Euro 2020 strategy, the European Commission's investment plan, the Juncker plan, next generation EU. So every time we ask questions about Europe, and they are mo mostly the same, you, you appoint a previous uh, Italian prime minister and you get with a big investment plan. 
But why would this time be more successful? I mean, when you look at Next Generation EU, and I'm sa not saying it's a failure, but what is clear is that uh, Italy, for instance, could only spend half the money. There is a huge problem of absorption capacity. If you talk to bankers that are active uh, uh, in present in Italy, they tell you, you know, in Italy, at any point in time, a judge can stop some works and it can last for 20 years. So you are never get to, going to get to these levels of investments without uh, dramatic changes. Uh, and so I think we need to spend more time on that part of, that part of the problem. And then uh, there is this idea that there should be a, a paradigm uh, shift in, the, in terms of EU governance. And I think it's, I mean, we should really ask ourselves the question, can the Commission deregulate? The Commission has been the champion of regulation and of exporting regulation in the last 20 to 30 years. So we would ask an institution that has been the champion of regulation to suddenly be the champion of deregulation. Let's see. I think it's also interesting to look at what the US is doing because sometimes when you hear and listen to uh, Democrats in the US, they tell you that to solve all the problems in the US, you should go to European policy making. And in Europe, we say uh, to solve European problems, we should be doing uh, like Biden has been doing. Now, if you look at the polls in the US, it's not like what Biden has been doing was extremely successful. And then again, you have this question, you know, if you do too much of relance, when you are faced with supply constraints, you get what? You get inflation. And then you get uh, people uh, being angry. So, of course, there are a number of things that the U.S. did uh, very well. I mean, in terms of red tape, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, giving subsidies fast and with impact, they, they, they do it right. Uh, but they were helped also by uh, migration, but we all know it's a difficult topic. And let, let's be frank, I mean, the U.S. will not, will not decarbonize its economy with a gas price at $10 per megawatt hour. It's just way too cheap. You're not going to decarbonize your economy with that. So you can, you can give a lot of subsidies, and at some point, fiscally, uh, it's not going to be sustainable. They have a huge deficit, but you are not going to decarbonize. So maybe in terms of sequence, it's the right way to go about it. You first invest in technology, and then you roll uh, them out when uh, they get cheap enough. But at some point, you have to restrict the use of uh, cheap gas. So climate transition, a few words on uh, the climate transition. I'm, I'm an optimistic as I look at the climate transition from a macro perspective. And I will come to the international perspective on the next slide. So I, I tend to be optimistic, but I think we have a, a big communication issue. We sold the transition, and I'm not alone to saying that. I mean, uh, uh, I guess Jean Pisani Ferry has, has been using relatively strong wording uh, in, in putting that uh, in his papers. We've sold the transition as a walk in the park, as a great opportunity. I mean, I was recently at a meeting of our constituency in Moldova, and there was someone from an international organization basically saying, we need to leverage the potential of the climate transition, as if it was a solution to the problems of countries in the region. Now, it is a supply shock. The climate transition is re really basically saying the price of oil and gas and coal has to go to infinite actually not infinite, but to the cost of the, the most expensive uh, green technology uh, between now and 2050. Now, if I tell you the price of oil is going to go to uh, 1,000 euro per barrel, most economists would say, yes, that's not really good news and that's not going to do good to the economy. But that's it. That is the climate transition. It is a supply shock. Now, is it a big supply shock? And I'm going, not going to go into the details of how we got there, but I think there is an emerging consensus that for an economy like ours in Belgium, it's probably, you know, between 2.5, um, 3.5% of today's GDP, probably 2.5% of 2050's GDP. That's 10 basis points of growth per year. If the question is, you know, do you want to save the planet and it's going to take to cost you 10 basis points of growth for 25 years, I think it's a no-brainer. Uh, and that's why, I mean, when I look at it from that perspective, it should be relatively easy. But then again, in terms of the way we frame the issue, how many times don't you hear, we need to find hundreds of billions. So please look all 
below your seat, under your seat, whether you find hundreds of billions. I mean, it's such a stupid way to frame the discussion. We're not going to find hundreds of billions. And the question, I think, is not about finding money. It's about prioritization and who's going to pay. And that's really the question we don't want to ask. And that's where we see we're extremely weak. I mean, we, we, we come with a number of policies, and then we have farmers going with a few tractors to Brussels, and pff, it unravels. So we need to face the issue of the limited but real cost of the transition and who's going to have to pay. Okay. Uh, so I'm still relatively optimistic on the uh, uh, macro front because I think at the end of the day, the cost of the transition is not that big. But there is an international dimension. I mean, I've already more or less said it. We tend too much to, to compare energy prices, energy per energy, so gas to gas, and we say, okay, we are now four or five times more expensive than the US with luck. Uh, it's going to be three times in a few years with more LNG uh, coming um, uh, into, into production. And then we look at electricity, we are st twice more expensive. But that's not the right comparison. What we need to compare is the US doing nothing with gas at 10 euro and Europe having to move to green electricity or to decarbonized fuels. And then you will see we are structurally five to 10 times more expensive. And then the question is, what are the implications of being five to 10 times more expensive in terms of energy? Well, it means a no number of uh, uh, plants will close in Europe and reopen in the US. And then we have to look at the political consequences of that. And I think that's the very uh, tough part of uh, the discussion. Another one is really, if you look at technologies and the cost of um, uh, the technologies in terms of uh, uh, cost of abatement per ton, uh, uh, that's what we have in the graph here, actually, it looks like it's going to take time. It's going to be easier for households than for firms and for, for industry. I mean, we have a number of technologies that are already close to being competitive or already competitive. Renewables, that's green electricity. Uh, some insulation, not too much, but some insulation is sometimes uh, cheap enough. EVs will, within 10 or 15 years, be on par with combustion engine uh, and uh, heat pumps. So there, when you look at the literature and projection, we say actually the green premium might converge to zero and might actually be negative. But of course, politicians are afraid because households vote. So there is a lot of focus on you know, social fund and so on, on not uh, being too brutal with voters. And indeed, I mean, if you are a bit brutal, we've seen it with the gas border debate in Germany, you get a backlash, you get the farmers and uh, you have to, 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 uh, to backtrack. If you look at industry, sadly enough, over the last two years, we only and mainly got bad news. Green hydrogen was the name of the game. It was, you know, everybody was talking of about two euro or dollar per kilo. That was 60 euro per megawatt hour. At that time, gas prices was, uh, were around that price and would say, okay, we replace relatively expensive gas with hydrogen. Now it's like, no, no, it's going to be much more expensive than that. And, you know, try to put hydrogen at 300 bars per kilo pressure in a pipe that goes like this. It just doesn't work. So if not green hydrogen, then what kind of hydrogen? Maybe blue hydrogen with carbon capture. And then we go to carbon capture. And then on carbon capture, you have people telling you 100 euro per ton if the fumes are clean. And others that tell you, no, it's between 250 and 500. So today, we don't know how to carbonize every energy-intensive industry in Europe. And we are going to have to decide whether we go for uh, net zero in 2014 in the ETS. Good luck. So my own version of Draghi uh, in less than 400 pages, we have a trilemma. We have a trilemma between trade openness protection and defense and uh, strengthening of the single market and the climate ambition. We can have two of them, we cannot have three of them, or we muddle through with uh, some uh, uh, changes at the margin on the three fronts. So where are the signs of tension? Um, on the climate front, you know, calls for a pause or whatever, uh, we've seen a, a lot of uh, the climate ambitions being open for discussion, you know, the combustion engine uh, 
ban in, in uh, 35 and the likes. On the trade openness front, of course, we have CBAM, discussions about tariffs on Chinese EVs and the like. And on the single market front, we have now a subsidy war going on in Europe. For instance, in the steel industry, we apparently have a very uh, efficient plant here in Ghent. Uh, the Flemish region was offering 400 million subsidies to make some green investment. Then Dunkirk was offering 700 million, and then somewhere in Germany they were offering 1 billion euro, and the Commission is, you know, watching somewhere else. So we are today um, endangering uh, the uh, single market. And, and to go back to what I was saying about the technologies, we, we have a, UA, a EU social uh, climate fund for households, and we are taxing industry. I think we really have to think deeply whether we should not reinvest 100% of the proceed of ETS1 in industry so that we have the, the right marginal price, but we don't, from a macro perspective, tax industry uh, where industry is being subsidized uh, in the US. But then we have to do it in a way which um, uh, does not kill the single market with some uh, regulation and, and rules at the European level. Okay, let me conclude. Uh, Yes, it is often about geopolitics. I think if the U.S. would be European go, uh, if the U.S. would be going our way with Japan and others, and at some point China, with a carbon price, it would be much easier. You know, it's a collective uh, uh, coordination problem, and we are moving in in different directions, and it's, it's creating a lot of tensions. Um, but but I think beyond that, I mean, we still have this question: what is choice? deep choice that is not going to change, and what is uh, maybe at the margin things we need to work on. Um, and I'm a bit concerned that if you, if you look at the two areas where the Commission had a monopoly on trade and competition, the consensus is unraveling. Now, we've built Europe on this consensus, free competition, openness to trade. If you, and that, on the basis of that, you can uh, outsource it to an administration because it's easy. It's the playbook of Econ 101. We are open to trade and we are open to competition. As soon as you want to say, no, it's more complex than that, you have the question, who is dealing institutionally with that complexity? Which political process? Because you cannot outsource complexity of that kind to the commission. And that makes it extremely difficult, I think. And that's, uh, in a way, back to my uh, more transactional environment uh, and then you have all the rest that is on the slide, but, um, you know, populism, uh, uh, fragile governments, majorities, uh, and, and the likes that make, it, uh, that make it ever more difficult to even take uh, any uh, decision and form a government. On rules. Um, rules are, of course, important. Uh, I think we have arrived at a, at a, a level of regulation in Europe that makes it extremely difficult to do about everything or anything. I mean, we don't produce anything at the National Bank of Belgium, but when I look at all the rules and statistical rules, GDPR and so on, we have to invest a lot in being compliant and honestly to deal with risks that have never materialized over the last 20 to 30 years and it's creating a lot of bad mood uh, in our research department, for instance. Um, I read this article, uh, the guy is, is great, uh, Janan uh, Ganesh in DFT, I think all his papers are great, but he said the US did not plan to outgrow Europe. We need to think about it. We want to be competitive like Europe, but we want to plan being competitive. Not sure it, it's going to work, so we have this tension between a sort of dirigist uh, way of uh, wanting to be competitive, and uh, I'm not sure that's actually what, what we need. As I was saying, this is Eurosclerosis 2.0. We have to ask ourselves, how did they go about it uh, when it was Eurosclerosis 1.0? Well, it was Reagan, and it was not Europe, of course, in the US, but it was Thatcher and the likes uh, in Europe. I don't, I don't see, and I'm not pleading for it, but I don't see uh, a political uh, movement going in that direction uh, this time around. And I think part of the good luck, but also the problem is that because of the demography, labor markets will remain uh, relatively tight. So the cost of, uh, being, of lacking dynamism and growth uh, from a social and job perspective is much less than it used to be 
after the old shocks. So actually, the pain of uh, lagging behind is not the same as we had in the 80s and, I mean, my generation trying to find jobs uh, and, you know, going with a thousand people at the ESL here in Brussels to pass exams for uh, public sector. Okay, I will, I will leave it at that uh, as an introduction for uh, very uh, interesting uh, papers and um, keynote speeches on the 3Ds. Thank you so much.